Can you make any sense of life? Can you make any sense of why we're here or what we're doing here or where it's all going? Many of us are concerned about that and really can't make any sense of it. And so we on this program have been discussing that question for some months now. And what we have decided to do is to go back to some of the stuff that many of us were taught in our early days was the key to the whole meaning of life. And it's stuff that really we have learned to kind of despise and toss away as meaningless religious jargon. And so it's a little difficult to go back to it and to break through into understanding it. But that's what we've decided to do. And so actually, after discussing what kind of authority would help us with this kind of problem, we decided it had to be somebody that was more than a human being. And that's what led us to thinking of that man, Jesus of Nazareth, who is really the only man that has ever shown that he could overcome death and could pass off this world and come back to it again. And that led us, of course, to the men that he taught and to the things that he himself believed in. And that led us eventually back to the early book that many of us were taught was the center of truth when we were children. And that is, of course, this old book called the Bible. So I ask you, don't turn the radio off. Don't decide, oh, this is another Bible thumper. I'm not a Bible thumper, and none of us are interested in Bible thumping. We're anxious to intelligently examine whatever clues we have in our world that would help us with this question, because we're concerned. There are more of us than ever before committing suicide. There are more of us than ever before are absolutely bewildered and confused. And it's very important to get some clear idea of what the point of this whole existence is, especially before we pass out of it, because we'd better find out what it is. Otherwise, we have little idea of what we're going to. And so that's why we're talking about the account that we believe the maker himself, the creator of the world, uh, revealed to the first men and women. If you like to Adam and Eve, if there was an Adam and Eve, he revealed it to the Adam and Eve. But whoever the first two people were, and any biologist will tell you, of course it had to start with two people. So whoever those first two people were, and if it was Adam, that comes from the Hebrew word Adama, which means ground, and Eve, which comes from the Hebrew word meaning life, then let's accept that it's Adam and Eve. But the truth is, as far as we can see it from this book, that the maker of the world revealed to them what he had done. And, of course, we were studying uh, these uh, facets of the creation to see how it uh, re reflected the very makeup of our own personalities today. And we were looking at that verse in its Genesis 2. It's about the second chapter in the Bible. And if you ever have a Bible, you should look up, look it up. It's in verse 7. And it says, the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. That is, first of all, he made us our bodies from the dirt, from the earth. And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That is ruach, is the Hebrew word for breath. It means spirit. And you remember we were saying that's why many of us feel at times we should be better than we actually are because there's something of God's spirit in us. That's why we feel at times we were made to live forever. We do feel that, don't we? Don't you feel that at times? I mean, you can be very cynical and you say, oh, no, this world will finish in a few years' time for me. We'll die and we'll just go into the earth. But deep down, deep in our deeper, most deepest heart, we feel, yeah, but... We were made to live forever. Well, there's something more, surely, than just 70 years and out like a light. There has to be. And, of course, there are other things inside us that make us feel something is valuable in us beyond us ourselves. I mean, some people say, you know, you're worth about seven and sixpence. So that's the old English money, isn't it? But it's something like, I suppose... 
what would it be? Maybe about uh, uh, a, a pound, uh, one pound today, perhaps. Some people say if you melt us all down, when you examine the chemicals that make us up and sell it all, you'd get about a pound for us. And yet you know that you feel worth much more than a pound. I mean, not just because your mum said you're the most valuable thing in the whole world, which all our mums say to us at some point, but you do feel you're unique. You feel you're different. You feel in some way there's nobody like you. And actually that's true. There is nobody like you. You are unique. But one of the reasons why you feel you're uniquely valuable is because there's something of the maker's spirit in you. There's something unique in you that makes you different from your dog. There is, isn't there? I mean, you look into your dog's eyes and sometimes you imagine he's smiling, but really it's all your imagination. There's something in your eyes that can never appear in his. There's a spirit in your eyes that can never appear in his eyes. There's something in you that makes you different from an animal. There's a self-consciousness, there's a self-critical faculty that makes you different from animals. Animals don't ponder much over what they've done that day and whether it was right or wrong. They just live for the moment. But there's something in you that is able to look in upon yourself and examine yourself and compare yourself with standards that you know are higher than your own. And that is part of God's spirit inside you. And the rest of the verse goes, and man became a living being. And actually the King James translation is better. It says man became a living soul. And the Hebrew word is nephesh. And it's as if, you know, you put some instant coffee into a cup of water and that produced a third substance called coffee. Uh, God took dust from the ground, made our bodies, breathed into our bodies his spirit, and we became living souls, a third substance. So it's as if we have three levels of consciousness. We have a spirit and we have a body and then we have a soul. And it might interest you to know that the Greek word for soul is suke. And through uh, the changes that come, the uh, sound changes that come in the English language, that etymologically came to be the word psyche uh, in English. And of course, it's the word that is put together with logia, logos, the Greek word logos, which means a way of thinking or a system of thinking. And you get the word psyche logos or psychology. And that's a way of thinking about the soul. And so that gives you a clue as to what part the soul is in your being. The soul is the psychological part of you. And as the broadcasts go on, we'll try to talk about what is the makeup of that soul so that you begin to know how to operate it yourself in the way it was intended to at the very beginning. So you can see that at the very beginning, the maker, our creator, made us with three levels of consciousness. First, a level of body that is conscious of the world outside. It's through our eyes and our ears, our five senses, that we become aware of the outside physical world. And then within that, in the very innermost part of it, is our spirit. That's the part that relates to the creator or the maker of the universe. And then round that is our soul or the psychological part of it. So some people have said it's as if we have three coats, you know. We have the innermost one, the spirit, and then the outer one is the soul, and then right around that again we have the body. If you say to me, well, what really is our spirit? Well, probably it's the real you. It's you as you really are. Do you remember the old classical statement made by somebody like Seneca or one of the old Roman philosophers who said, what a man is when he is alone, that he is and nothing more. That's probably your spirit. What you are independent of all the drives and all the outside pressures that make you perform like a little puppet, what you are deep down in yourself, what you really are, the essence of you yourself, that's your spirit. That's the unique expression of God's spirit in this universe that you alone have contained and possessed. That's your spirit. And of course, the maker of the universe had a definite plan for us. I mean, he made us like that because he wanted to have friendship with us. That's why he made us. He made us with the three levels of consciousness that he himself has because he wanted us to be his friends. He wanted us to live with him forever, to love him and to be close to him. Actually, he is our father and he wants us to be his children. That's why he made us like himself. 
That's why he didn't make us like animals, because he couldn't have fellowship with an animal. But he made us like a person, because he is a person, and he wanted to have friendship, and he wanted to have love with us and for us, and he wanted to experience our love for him. That's why he made us like that. So let's talk a little more tomorrow about what actually happened in the process of that crisis.